Um, just um, going back to the structure of your business, I mean, I've just learned so much studying Warren. I first was introduced to him when I was 13 or 14, and just studied him as intensely as possible every day I can. And in structuring our business and watching others, I just found the fund structure, whether it's public mutual funds or a hedge fund, it's so difficult to get quasi-permanent capital. So I made the decision at our firm to really build a separate account business. And unlike Tom, ours are balanced, and we manage large amounts of our clients' capital which is an enormous responsibility. And we ask clients a couple things regarding what Jason had asked earlier. The first is, what's the purpose of the pool of capital you're looking for us to manage? What's the purpose? Obviously, preservation of capital, but growth, income. About 75% of our clients are small business owners. They have enough business risk, et cetera, so they view us as safe, high-quality capital for their future. The second thing we ask them is, what's their time horizon? Um, you know, how long are they looking? Do they need income from this? Do they need growth, a combination? And then the third thing we tell them, and this is very challenging, we ask them not to exceed their risk tolerance emotionally or financially. And those are really difficult for people to sit down and think about. You can have a very wealthy client who financially, they could be, you know, invested in equities 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. But emotionally, the volatility really bothers them. You could also have the opposite, and that is someone with much lower capital, but that doesn't, the volatility doesn't bother them. So when we first meet with them, we don't even want to talk about money. We want to get to know them. What are their goals? What's their business? What's their family structure? We're trying to build multi-generational relationships, exactly what Warren does in the way he looks at the world. And so that's kind of how we've structured it. And as a result, we don't allow positions, Berkshire is an exception. When positions really get high, and Mohawk comes to mind, we've been very fortunate. When Mohawk got into the mid-200s, we've owned it for 13, 14 years, we feel an obligation and a responsibility to sell it. Some people paid 18, 20, 22, so we reduce the holding. We just don't want holdings to get to 18, 20, 25, 30 percent of a portfolio. So we've been slowly lowering some of our allocations and holdings we've had for 10 or 15 years. And so we control the risk within our portfolios, not only by trying to do enormous due diligence about what we own, but we also use the fixed income component and lower the equity component to do some of that. Paul, you, uh, you talked about this, the process you use to try to screen your clients. And just getting back for a second to my question about having to fire people, what was your experience in 2008, 2009? Did you find after the fact that you had properly vetted these people or did some of them get much colder feet than they expected or you expected? That's a great question. Um, one of the things we've done, again, I learned it from watching Mr. Buffett, we put out two really lengthy letters a year. They're typically 30 pages. I tell our clients exactly what we're doing. And over time, uh, as Mr. Buffett has educated me, I've tried to educate our clients in terms of how we look at the world. So in March of 2009, we got one phone call. That was it. I will say, however, we had a couple of clients that were really nervous, obviously, and really concerned. Uh, and one in particular um, was really disappointing because they wanted us to reduce, in March of 2009, their equity allocation. Um, and it still bothers me. It doesn't bother them at all. They accepted full responsibility, but it probably cost them about $10 million today in gains. Mm. Um, and when I see them, that's what registers in my mind. But beautifully and fortunately for me, it doesn't in her mind because it was her decision. But the point is, it's her money, and so ultimately followed what they did. But those are the two things that really jump out at me. Right. So now I want to ask each of you, um, and maybe we'll start with you, Whitney, what is emulatable about Berkshire 
and what isn't? About Berkshire as opposed to Buffett and his Buffett's, investment strategy. Buff, Buffett's Berkshire. From the investment point of view. Yeah, I mean, he's really built such a unique entity um, uh, that, you know, marries the public uh, market investing with wholly owned businesses uh, and then has, ca you know, a billion five a month flows into Omaha, free cash flow that Berkshire now generates, and then he can invest it anywhere in the world. So it's, it's a much more robust reinvestment engine than almost any other company on earth because mm -hmm. He can look at anything. He can take profits from C's candy and go buy an Israeli tool maker or, or, or buy, buy more Wells Fargo stock or something. And there's really no other business in the world that can do that. So um, it is very, very, very difficult. Um, people, uh, the, getting back to what we were just talking about, about the in, unstable nature of investment capital. Um, and uh, while it has been an enormous tax disadvantage for Buffett to have operated his investment career uh, in a corporate structure, it has given him permanent capital. He has not, during times of absolute crisis, where people lost confidence in Warren Buffett, uh, you know, during the internet bubble, and again in 08, uh, where the stock sold off and the credit default swaps you know skyrocketed it was it was stunning stunning um, he made he had a vehicle where he could not suffer redemptions and be forced to sell etc so um, so now you see some of the savviest investors in the world um, you know uh, Bill Ackman's created Pershing Square Holdings he now has half of his capital in permanent capital and it turns out the timing's pretty well, you know, with the whole Valiant firestorm and so forth. Um, his capital and his hedge funds is locked up for either two years or one-eighth quarterly. That's half his money, so that's, that money can't get out anytime soon. And the other half of his capital is permanent, permanent capital, right? So he can withstand uh, this Valiant storm and come back and live to fight another day and surely will. So, uh, so you know, I'm much too small to be thinking of creating, you know, that kind of structure. But, uh, but some, of, some of the largest and smartest guys are trying to emulate, uh, you know, what Buffett's done and get as much permanent capital as they have because that's really, really, really valuable even if the fees on it are lower. Yeah. Tom, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, can you just repeat the question? It was quite particular. Uh, yeah. I was saying what, what is it about <clears throat> Buffett's Berkshire that you feel other people can emulate, and what can't they emulate? Okay, so I think the um, most valuable thing within Berkshire that we can try to emulate and, and get the outcome by um, educating and working with our investors is the ability to do nothing. The ability to do nothing is so valuable in the investment business because <clears throat> up against people for whom trading is somehow uh, a verification of hard work. Um, if you do nothing for three or four years, your, your investors um, have to realize that there's a real value to that. I think Berkshire gives us the um, evidence that, that you can manage money. Um, I think, as Paul indicated, I think you do need to educate your investors um, as to what it is that you seek so that the expectations are, are, are manageable. Um, in reference to your question about 2008, um, our, our investment, um, uh, 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 our investors would have been similarly predisposed, as, as Paul said, his work, with one group of exceptions, and those would be the investors who happened to have investments in other vehicles that required capital calls. So if there was, if there was request for funds during 2009, let's say, it was typically, I hate to do this, but we're facing a capital fund, we have no more money and we need to go to the liquid stocks that had retained more value than the funds that they were funding. So um, we educate the investor, and then the last thing is to operationally to try to turn down the noise of Wall Street. Um, I happen to uh, exist uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania as a business. It's, in, it, it's not unintentionally. It's also it's designed to be a quiet place. We sit around and read all day. Um, and then the last thing is I think um, what I've, what I've learned from Warren is you, you actually have to get out and go, go meet with businesses. There's a discrepancy between Warren and Charlie on this point. I think Warren is a student of businesses and hugs and learns from them as most he can. 
And, and Charlie would say that he stays fairly far away from management and doesn't do that. I prefer the prior. Uh, I go, I travel the world to meet with the managements who run our companies. Um, Warren told us in, in, in the annual meeting couple, within the last couple of years a wonderful story about how his research process went and he said he would go visit an industry, in this case it was the train industry, and he'd meet with all of the leaders in the industry and at the end of each meeting he would say to one, uh, to each of them, um, which of your competitors would you like to um, own shares in and why? And then which of your competitors would you like to sell the shares in and why? Um, it's that zest for knowledge, it's the desire to learn and to come up with information that can, that can um, provide the courage to hold positions when the market tells you you're badly wrong. And with regard, Jason, to what you could emulate, um, there's bits and pieces. There's just no one like him, so let's make that abundantly clear. But there's Markel. Um, you could be a very wealthy family with enormous wealth and you could try and do what Warren does to buy companies and businesses, but he's so multi-dimensional. I don't know of anyone that's ever housed all these unique capabilities and skills in one person. His mathematical and analytical mind is perhaps the finest in the world and he combines that with an incredible people skill. It's very rare to have anyone, I guess Byron was talking about he's a 10 as a human being, and then I would say he's a 10 analytically, but he's also a 10 as a people person. And normally people that are very, very good analytically are not very good on the people set. So he's combined those and created something really, he's just really unique and special. And so I think Seth has quasi-permanent capital with his customer base. He has the flexibility to do nothing um, and to do large transactions in a multitude of areas. So I think there's lots of people or some people that have some of the bits and pieces uh, that Mr. Buffett has, but I don't know of any organization that really has what he has. And then finally, one of the things that always impressed me uh, was how he's evolved as an analytical investor, a net-net math person, to a more qualitative investor. And he said many years ago that his greatest, greatest investments, which is really surprising, are not the mathematical ones for which most people would think. They were unique, qualitative insights. And in talking about Tom's process, one of the things that I did, my background began in competitive analysis and consulting. And what I've tried to do is simply take that skill set and apply it to studying businesses. So what we do is after we do all the financial analysis, the industry analysis, the horizontal analysis of all the competitors, we say to ourselves, what one, two, three, four people on the planet can give me unique differential insights? It might be a former CEO who spent 30 years in the industry. It might be a thought leader who's followed the industry. There's a variety of uh, sources, and we spend a lot of time trying to find those individuals to what we, call, we refer to it as making the numbers come to life. Because the numbers tell you the past. The problem is you're paying for the future. And so the only way for me, because I'm never going to be as smart as Mr. Buffett, is to really go out in the field in a very targeted way. And I don't mean calling people on the phone. They don't know you, they don't trust you. I mean really, really going and visiting with them and building a relationship where they'll trust you and share their insights, thoughts, and knowledge. So you create this external mosaic that dovetails on top of the numbers.